Today we have a presentation that I was going to talk about reclaiming life after cancer. It's obviously a significant area of the um, and certainly one for us as well. So, uh, so thank you, Dr. Wilson. Can you guys hear me? All right, so we'll get started. As Dr. Wilson mentioned, uh, this is going to be my area of interest, and uh, I'm basically going to talk about the long-term complications of cancer therapy, what problems can you expect in the survivors and what are the morbidi morbidities that come along with it. Uh, starting with the disclosure slide, I have no disclosures. And uh, my objectives are, I'll talk about the trends in incidence and survivorship uh, data on most of the common cancers in childhood and adolescence. Then I'll give you an overview of the long-term effects of cancer therapy in the survivors. And uh, then there are some guidelines for pri primary care physicians on surveillance and the management of these long-term effects. Okay, starting with uh, the latest trends in the childhood cancer, um, it has been estimated that each year there are about 16,000 new cancer diagnoses in the United States. So putting that into perspective, that means uh, each day about 43 kids are diagnosed with cancer. Uh, in recent years, we have seen uh, <coughs> improved uh, trends in um, survival, but still 12% uh, of these kids won't make it. And uh, you know, cancer, it, it doesn't differentiate between what race we are, if you're rich or poor, it just happens. Um, I know sometimes it's bad genes, sometimes it's just pure bad luck. And uh, on an average, uh, well, the average of age of the kids diagnosed with cancer in U.S. is six years. And uh, at any point each year, there are more than 40,000 kids getting uh, or being, that are being treated for cancer. So this is an incident slide. It, uh, so as you can see, there are about, uh, my pointer was working, okay, here. So one in 400 kids, uh, have cancer each year or diagnosed with cancer each year under the age of 15. So that puts the incidence as, at 0.24. Uh, but if you consider the age groups less than 20, the incidence rate increases by almost 50%. So there's something happening in that uh, uh, age group between 15 and 20, the incidence rate just goes up. Uh, everybody has seen this before. Uh, I'll just use my mouse. So leukemias uh, or ALL is the most common uh, cancer or childhood malignancy. And if you look at all leukemias and lymphomas, uh, they make up to 40% of total childhood cancers. Include brain tumors and that, that brings the number at 60%. So your leukemias and brain tumors, they're almost uh, two thirds of total cancers that you see in this population. Again, I said ALL is the most common cancer in childhood, but uh, if you look at the distribution, ages 0 to 14 and 15 to 19, the distribution changes dramatically. So in younger kids, you'll say, see a lot of ALL followed by brain tumors and neuroblastoma is also common. But if you go to this age group, uh, 15 to 19, uh, mostly Hodgkin's lymphoma, that, that's the bulk of the cancer you'll see in that age group followed by thyroid cancers, which we don't see a whole lot of here. But uh, when you're seeing adolescents, you should keep in mind that these are the cancers that can happen different from leukemias. Again, leukemias are still common. You should also think about your uh, uh, germ cell tumors, testicular tumors, and ovarian tumors in this uh, age group. This is a slide that uh, shows the survivorship uh, trends, and it practically mirrors uh, the incidence trend. ALL is the most common tumor followed by brain tumors, uh, and that's what you see among survivors. Uh, most of your survivors uh, are in these two age groups. You can read here, there are about 400,000 uh, uh, survivors of childhood cancer in the US right now. Uh, and it didn't used to be a problem when there were not many, very many kids surviving, but we're getting more and more of kids surviving these tumors, and that's why uh, this, uh, is a topic that needs more attention because these are the kids that will go into adulthood and uh, face all these problems. Uh, 
again, uh, if you divide the incidence uh, by age and by sex, uh, boys seem to have more cancers than girls. There's not a much, uh, a lot of difference bet between boys and girls and uh, the adolescent. However, if you look at mortality, especially in the adolescent age group, it looks like uh, the mortality rates are higher among boys compared to girls. Not much difference uh, in younger age groups. Uh, and that reflects in your survivorship trends. Less boys are surviving uh, compared to girls uh, in the adolescent age group. Okay, so this is a, a slide showing the trends in pediatric uh, cancers, and they've uh, looked over about 30 years from 19 uh, or 35 years, 1975 to 2010, and uh, there's a sharp rise in incidence in your uh, ALL and brain tumors. Now, part of this is because we have better diagnostic techniques. We have uh, we're using more MRIs, we, we've got more molecular diagnostic techniques, so we were able to recognize these tumors better and early. Uh, interestingly, your Hodgkin lymphoma uh, has declined in incidence, whereas your non-Hodgkin's has gone up. And you've, if you look at these bottom four lines, uh, ovarian, retinal, blastoma, wilms, uh, and rhabdomyosarcoma, they're pretty much a flat line, so their incidence hasn't changed much. Luckily uh, for us, even though some of the cancers, the incidence rate has increased, uh, most of uh, the sur survivor has, survival has increased in most of these, uh, or all of these uh, cancer groups. And we'll talk about survival in the next slide. Okay. So again, this uh, is a slide that compares the survivor uh, ship trends or the rates. For most common childhood cancers, uh, they looked at uh, the survival over five years, 1975 to 79, which is uh, depicted in the green line uh, by the green bars, and uh, 2003 to 2009, <coughs> depicted by the uh, orange bars here. And we've seen some impressive uh, survival rates uh, between for these cancers. ALL, our survival ship rate is at 90%. Same for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Neuroblastoma, uh, modest increase, and uh, for testicular germ cell tumors, uh, we've seen a sharp rise. If you look at thyroid cancers here, we've always had good survivorship. I mean, 99%, that's, that's pretty good. So what are the late effects that uh, these survivors can face later in their life? And sometimes uh, there's no real timeline. These Effect. Sometimes they happen early, sometimes they might not happen for decades after you finish your therapy. Uh, there are different ways to look at these uh, uh, late effects. Either you can look at them by disease, uh, you can look at, at them by what kind of treatment they got, either they got chemotherapy or stem cell transplant or uh, radiation therapy, or uh, just look at the system affected by these trends. Uh, okay. So the treatment of childhood cancer, it's uh, and everybody knows this, it's one of the greatest success stories in oncology. Uh, if you go back to 1950s, uh, telling these parents and patients that you have cancer, it's practically uh, a death sentence for them. Now, uh, the first time uh, the chemotherapy was successful was in 1950s when Dr. Uh, uh, Sidney Farber, he used methotrexate in mid-50s and uh, he was actually uh, not an oncologist, he was a pathologist by training. And that's when he showed, okay, there are these agents that you can use to kill these cancer cells and these patients will survive. Again, it was just one agent being used and then came the phase of, or the era of uh, combination chemotherapy, radiotherapy came and then now we make much advances in stem cell transplant too. Now, even though we've seen all these uh, increased survival rates, uh, there are a lot of problems that come with these survival rates. and. Uh, all these, as I said, uh, morbidities uh, <coughs> associated with it, they have been uh, called late effects. And according to one report, about 95% of these kids will have some kind of chronic health condition by age 45. That's practically everybody who's surviving. They're going to have some kind of problem. Now, uh, what all of systems can be affected? Um, simple answer is, Every system can be affected by these uh, chemotherapeutic agents or radiation therapy. 
most common being the endocrine effects. You can have some cardiovascular toxicities, uh, pulmonary effects, uh, neurocognitive, and that's the thing that we don't pay too much attention to. They can have, they can go on to develop a secondary malignancy, <coughs> second malignant uh, neoplasm. And then there are other effects like uh, these patients don't have insurance. These patients have uh, financial issues. They're constantly worrying about recurrence of tumor, uh, anxiety, depression, those kind of things. Okay, so this is, as I said, uh, the most common uh, late effect you'll see. Uh, and uh, they've been combined into endocrine and uh, reproductive disturbances. And it can affect up to 40 to 60 percent of uh, childhood cancer survivors. Now, this is a study that uh, came out of Sweden, uh, Denmark, Norway, and uh, Ireland. And uh, the biggest conclusion or the main conclusion of this study was uh, if you look at the endocrine effects, uh, the risk of uh, endocrine effects is 4.8 times higher in survivors compared to the general population. So you are at basically five times more risk of developing an endocrinopathy in your life if you're a cancer survivor. <coughs> and for Kate, another uh, conclusion for the study was uh, for survivors who were diagnosed with cancer between five and nine years of age, by the time you reach 60 years of age, there's a 50% chance you'll have an endocrinopathy. Now, all of these might not be directly related to your cancer therapy, and I don't think there's a good way to establish what's coming directly from your endocrinopathy, but uh, if you just compare uh, trends with the general population, it's five times higher. Hypothalamic pituitary axis, it's the most commonly affected part of the brain due to uh, endocrinopathy, and uh, what are the kids that are at risk? Uh, patients that received cranial cranial irradiation or patient who had surgery affecting the hypothalamic pituitary area. And it can affect all the hormones that are being secreted by uh, hypothalamus and pituitary. And, uh, and some of our residents in turns relate to this because we have some patients that come with these chronic issues. Now, uh, radiation dose. So how much radiation is too much? Patients who receive radiation more than 18 gray they can have an absolute deficiency of growth hormone. Uh, or they can have derangements in uh, their LH and uh, FSH levels that can lead to central uh, precocious puberty. Now, if you look at the higher radiation doses, 30 to 40, uh, you can have deficiency. So these were just derangements. You can have a deficiency of all these hormones. Uh, now, for ADH deficiency, there are certain tumors that have a predilection for this part of the brain, histiocytosis, geminomas, or if you have surgical trauma to the brain. Now, uh, the risk of pituitary dysfunction, it's both time and dose dependent. Uh, the higher the dose, the more chance you'll uh, develop these. Uh, and it may not be uh, apparent until several years after the treatment is done. Growth hormone, uh, any radiation more than 18 gray can put you at risk for absolute growth hormone deficiency. And as I said, uh, all the brain tumors that are located near hypothalamus or pituitary, especially craniopharyngiomas, and the surgical trauma that's caused uh, post-resection. Now, uh, this is an older study. This, this was or originally published in 1980, and this is a re uh, print from the original publication. So what uh, these authors did, they looked at the kids that received growth hormone. So there are, if you look closely, there are two solid uh, circles. Uh, the first solid circle is uh, when the growth hormone therapy was initiated and the second solid circle is when the growth ha uh, hormone therapy ended. And when the, the, these kids were followed up, these were all girls that received uh, irradiation to the brain. And they found that your uh, final height, you were still far below the growth chart. So even though you got growth hormone therapy, it did not uh, help your uh, final height. And they gave several reasons why this happened. The first reason was uh, irradiation also puts you at risk for uh, um, precocious puberty. So there's early maturation of your uh, epiphysis, so early skeletal maturation. And uh, these were early studies. There was no definite dose set for growth hormone therapy back then. And uh, some authors mentioned, uh, authors also mentioned that uh, the time of initiation was too late. So it has been shown in several studies, even though 
if you treat with if you treat with growth hormone it's the response you see is not the same as if you would treat a child with idiopathic growth hormone deficiency so what are the recommendations for primary care providers so these all of these kids ideally these kids should go to a long term follow up clinic but <coughs> due to dearth of resources transportation issues and all these uh, centers are in bigger cities so, so a lot of these patients will be seeing their primary care providers so primary care, care providers should uh, keep a close eye on the linear growth of uh, these kids uh, especially after completion of therapy and if at any time you suspect uh, growth hormone deficiency you should uh, refer these kids to an endocrinologist the endocrinologist will perform two different growth hormone stimulation tests using two different pharmacologic agents it has to be uh, and if the kids fail those uh, there's a diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency that's established. They also mention, uh, and these guidelines are, are from uh, Children's Oncology Group Cancer Survivorship uh, Guideline. They have a full website and they have detailed guidelines for each and every of these conditions. Insulin-like growth factor one and insulin-like insulin -like growth factor uh, um, binding protein three, they're not reliable markers. Once the, you irradiate these kids, uh, uh, you should not look at these markers for growth hormone deficiency. Now, for management, um, you should, uh, there should be a comprehensive consultation. The oncologist, parents, child, a child psychologist, uh, and an endocrinologist should sit together and they should uh, weigh the risk and benefits of this uh, growth hormone therapy. Because, and the reason that's important because there are certain reports of kids <coughs> who receive growth hormone therapy, there is slightly higher chance of them developing cancers later in life. And once you have this, had this discussion, uh, growth hormone therapy can be provided to these patients. <coughs> now, uh, as I said, there's a slightly high chance of uh, developing a second neoplasm uh, in these kids. And this uh, study came uh, from the Childhood Cancer Survivorship uh, Group. And they concluded that the growth hormone therapy does not appear to increase the risk, appear to increase the risk of recurrence. But there's a slightly increased uh, number of second neoplasm, and uh, this mostly happened in, happened in kids uh, that were treated for acute leukemia. There were no uh, solid tumors that uh, record. So the jury is still out on there: should you use growth hormone therapy or should you not? But uh, again, as I said, uh, it should be a, a discussion with oncologist and endocrinologist. Okay. And this is a study that uh, looked at the final height uh, standard deviation score. So there were two time points, uh, the standard deviation score at the start of growth therapy and the final height. There was a small but significant increase in the final height uh, standard deviation score. So you, you can still use growth hormone even though there's a slightly higher chance of uh, these kids developing a, a secondary neoplasm. Now, moving on to uh, problems with gonadotropins. So, childhood uh, cancer survivors, they can, they're at risk of developing these three conditions. They can have precocious puberty, they can, uh, they're at risk of uh, pubertal delay, and they can also have pubertal arrest later in life. Now, the follow up for these kids should include uh, PCP, should record when these kids start developing their uh, secondary sexual characters and uh, once they reach their growth spurt, their height velocity should be plotted. Precocious puberty. So this happens when, uh, again, the definition is same as for general population. Eight years for girls or before nine years for boys. And this is due to the premature activation of HP axis and that leads to elevation of FSH and LH and then that can lead to early menarche. The risk factors. Uh, so the cranial radiation at those of more than 18 gray and uh, we'll see the difference between precocious puberty and pubertal delay the radiation dose changes any tumors of the hypothalamic pituitary region uh, radiation to the hypothalamus younger age at the diagnosis females and if you're obese you have a high risk of developing a uh, precocious puberty when to refer these kids any evidence of uh, early s development of secondary sexual characters, you should refer these kids to an endocrinologist. Uh, as I said, look at the tempo of the pu pubertal development. When you see the growth velocity is going 
too fast, you should send these patients to an uh, endocrinologist. Now, PCP should obtain FSH, LH, and uh, the wrist x-rays to look for the skeletal maturity. For boys, uh, get an early morning testosterone level. And for girls, get a estrogen level and also get a pelvic ultrasound. Now, if there are any abnormalities, a prompt refer referral should be made or if the primary care provider is not uh, comfortable uh, evaluating these kids, just send them to an, to an endocrinologist. Treatment is the same as for any precocious puberty, uh, Lupron or any long-acting gonadotropin hormone-releasing agonist. Now, delayed puberty. So, the definition for delayed puberty is any lack of uh, or lack of breast development in girls and testicular enlargement in boys uh, at an age that's two standard deviations later than uh, average for that uh, group. 13 for boys and four, oh, 13 for girls and 14 for boys. Now, risk factors. So, look at the radiation dose here. So, if you using lesser radiation puts you at risk for precocious <laughs> puberty, higher radiation puts you at risk for delayed puberty. Workup for these uh, kids, uh, again, your FSH, LH, your uh, testosterone and estrogen levels. The diagnosis is established by when you have low levels of uh, testosterone and estrogen in presence of normal or low uh, gonadotropin levels. Pay attention. Your gonadotropin levels don't have to be low. They can be normal. Also, look for a systemic cause. Get a prolactin level. Get your thyroid function studies, get a CBC, CMP, and ESR. Now, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. This is a condition that, will, that you can see in kids that have already reached their sexual maturity. So, pubertal delay and precocious puberty are not the case that you have to worry about. And uh, in males, uh, it can be dif difficult to diagnose because their only symptoms could be just reduced energy or stamina, loss of libido, but females can have menstrual irregularities. Uh, again, radiation dose more, more than 30 uh, gray. For males, uh, no matter what, if they have symptoms or not, just uh, these patients need to have a yearly testosterone level regardless of symptoms. For females, uh, get a baseline evaluation of FSH, LH and estrogen. And if later on in their life they develop symptoms, they need further evaluation. Moving on to thyroid disorders, cancer survivors, uh, their risk of at, they're at risk for a lot of thyroid conditions, primarily central and primary hypothyroidism, but they can also develop uh, hyperthyroidism. It's kind of uh, low on the list. These thyroid neoplasms, they are part of your second malignancies that these kids can develop. For <coughs> the same risk factors, surgery or high dose radiation to your uh, uh, hypothalamic pituitary area and up to 10% of patients that are treated with high dose radiation, this is, this is more than 30 or 40 gray, will develop central hypothyroidism. Now, uh, lower doses of radiation and chemotherapy, they don't put you at risk. So, if you receive low doses, just think about your growth hormone deficiency. But if your radiation dose is high, worry about all these uh, conditions. Now, screening for these kids, uh, annual screening, so all the kids should uh, receive uh, who received high dose radiation, of course, they should undergo thyroid function studies. They, this includes your TSH, TSH and free T4. And uh, the condition is usually diagnosed when you have a low uh, free T4 with a lower normal uh, uh, TSH concentration. Rarely your TSH level can be elevated. And as for any uh, case of hypothyroidism, these kids will need lifelong hormone replacement. Now, Primary hypothyroidism. This happens when you receive a radiation to your neck uh, or mantle area for uh, Hodgkin's or any condition, or you, if you receive your craniospinal or a total body radiation. Another factors that uh, put you at risk are your tyrosine kinase inhibitors, your uh, Gleevec. Uh, we, we use Gleevec for a lot of uh, CML therapy, but uh, that's a risk factor. And use of your iodine uh, radio labeled agents. Females, older age at diagnosis. This is probably one of the only conditions that puts you at risk when you're <coughs> older. It's usually all conditions when you're diagnosed early, you're more, at more risk. For these uh, kids, get a yearly TSH level. You don't have to get T4 level unless your TSH is deranged. And uh, 
Same as for uh, central hypothyroidism, lifelong hormone replacement. Hypothyroidism, as I said, it, this is much less common compared to your uh, primary and central hypothyroidism. Uh, it has been reported in patients of Hodgkin's lymphoma that were treated with the radiation days of a uh, high radiation dose, uh, survivors of ALL that re received a radiation dose of more than 15, and stem cell transplant recipients. Uh, so, and this, uh, this, was, this is due to the transfer of abnormal clones of uh, T or B cells from donor to recipient. Pretty much like a gross uh, graft versus host reaction. No screen retaining is needed unless patient is symptomatic or if there are uh, clinical indications. Central diabetes inhibitors, any tumor uh, of your hypothalamic uh, or posterior pituitary puts you at risk. It's quite rare. Surgical trauma is also a risk factor. And uh, if you see a patient with central diabetes insipidus, always think about uh, LCH, your histiocytosis. Now, uh, these patients, when they present with you, uh, they can have uh, polyuria, polydipsia, and the, uh, these symptoms, they can overlap between di diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus. So once you, when you screen for these patients, you have to screen for both conditions, uh, insipidus and diabetes mellitus. And uh, severe de dehydration can occur if you don't recognize this condition. Now, Chindal's oncology group does not uh, recommend routine screening for CDI. Screen only if uh, symptomatic, and you should obtain plasma sodium, serum osmolality, urine osmolality, urine sodium, and uh, that diagnosis uh, definition is same as for any central diabetes inhibitors. And uh, as I said, this kid should also be tested for diabetes mellitus, and your treatment is the same. Desmopressin. Bone mineral de density. This is what's, this is a condition that's not usually recognized. We give cancer therapy to these kids. These kids go on to live their lives and then can have fractures later in their life. The risk factors are uh, bone tumors, of course, when you have malignant infiltration of the bone, uh, your chemotherapy agents that interfere with the bone metabolism, especially your uh, glucocorticoids. And uh, you know these pa uh, patients, as I said, can have sex hormone deficiency and growth hormone deficiency that uh, puts them at risk for uh, low bone mineral density. And a lot of these patients will go on to have a poor nutrition status and a sedentary life. How to screen? Not everybody needs screening. Only patients who are at risk or fall under the categories we talk, or if they're having fractures. DEXA scan is your standard uh, screening tool. Uh, must be interpreted according to the age, height, and sex. Now, this is a newer modality, quantitative uh, CT. The good thing about this is it can measure both your cortical and trabecular bone mineral density. The Limitations are it's very expensive, uh, it's not available everywhere, and it, it's giving you high dose radiation. Or it can't kind of sound counterproductive. You're trying to look for uh, cancer complications and giving them more radiation. So, as of now, this is your uh, screening modality of choice. Management uh, you should encourage vitamin D and calcium supplements, uh, you should encourage uh, weight bearing exercises, and if you have a secondary cause like a sex hormone and growth hormone <laughs> deficiency, you should treat the cause. And for patients who have severely low T-scores on bone mineral, dens bone mineral density or if they're having multiple fractures, these kids need to go see an endocrinologist. Obesity, up to 40% of these kids that survive will go on to have obesity. And the risk factors are cranial irradiation, younger age, and steroid therapy. Also, uh, these kids can have deranged glucose homeostasis uh, that goes along with the growth hormone deficiency. And if you received cranial or abdominal uh, or total body irradiation. Now, this is a study uh, that looked at the uh, BMI uh, scores for these kids. They looked at three time points at the time of diagnosis, at the time when they finished the therapy, and at the time when they Reached, uh, reached their final height, and uh, they uh, divided, uh, they looked at the do uh, radiation dose, 18 and uh, 24 gray. It's a dose-dependent response. The higher the dose of radiation you receive, the more chances of you uh, having a higher BMI uh, at the end of therapy and once you finish your final, 
once you reach a, a final height. Screening, uh, there is no screening tool. Every visit you should look at their BMI or plot them on a growth chart um, and always counsel them about lifestyle changes, physical activity, stop smoking, uh, eat healthy. Uh, and for glucose homeostasis, if these kids are insulin resistant, you should start them on metformin or send them to an endocrinologist. Now moving on to cardiac effects. Uh, now this is one of the most serious condition or complication can, that can develop. Endocrino endocrinopathies you can manage, you can give some medications, but uh, these kids can have tenfold higher mortality compared to the age matched uh, controls. And it's the third leading cause of death in survivors. The first one being the recurrence of tumor and the second one being uh, the secondary neoplasms that happen. Now, some people say second and third are, there's always debate between second and third cause, but uh, primary tumor recurrence is the leading cause of death. Now, uh, these kids can develop cardiomyopathies, uh, pericarditis, they can go on to have congestive heart failure, uh, uh, heart uh, valve defects, or early uh, atherosclerotic disease. Um, uh, leading causes that can cause cardiotoxicity, your anthracycline therapy, and the radiation to uh, chest, or total body radiation. Now these are much uh, less, or uh, on the lower on the list, they don't contribute as much. Now anthracyclines, uh, there have been several studies and reports that have established uh, doxorubicin, dinorubicin, they put you at risk for uh, life-threatening cardiomyopathy. When this cardiomyopathy develops, it does not respond well to inotropic or diuretic therapy, and the mortality rates can be uh, as high as 50%. There have been several proposed mechanisms, but the leading theory is that uh, it leads to generation of free uh, radicals and the uh, incorporation of iron in the cardiomyocytes. Now, there are three kinds of uh, cardiomyopathy or uh, toxicity you can see with anthracyclines, uh, acute that just happens almost immediately, chronic that can happen within three years, and the late onset that can happen uh, decades after you finish your uh, therapy. Now this chronic and late effect, so this is basically an idiosyncratic uh, drug reaction. These are uh, dose and time dependent. Risk factors. Uh, for cardiotoxicity due to anthracyclines, uh, younger age at diagnosis, uh, your combination therapy with other agents, African Americans, females, or if you have any pre existing heart conditions, liver conditions. Now, uh, there have been several studies that have looked at the, with uh, anthracyclines, we always talk about the cumulative dose, how much dose or total dose did, did these kids get during the course of uh, therapy. In adults, uh, they receive much higher dose, but there's again a dose response. If your dose is between five and 550, you're at 4% risk of uh, developing cardiomyopathy. But that risk increases ninefold if your dose is more than 600. Same for kids, uh, less than 300 or more than 300, you have 11 fold higher risk of developing cardiomyopathy. Again, looking at, uh, so this is epirubicin, uh, uh, and uh, if you can see, uh, Around those of 1,200, uh, there's a 50% of chance of you developing uh, cardiomyopathy, and it's a dose-dependent uh, response. Now, moving on to effects due to radiation, uh, about 5% of patients that uh, receive, uh, received radiation for Hodgkin's lymphoma, they went on to develop a symptomatic heart condition within 10 years. And uh, radiation can cause constricting pericarditis, your, uh, at much more higher risk of developing a valve disease or coronary artery disease if you received radiation compared to if you received anthracycline therapy. Now again, uh, radiation puts you at risk for developing early coronary artery disease and uh, also it uh, happens in kids that have pre-existing risks for developing it. Now this is a slide uh, looking at uh, your risk of developing uh, myocardial infarctions for patients uh, who received uh, radiotherapy for Hodgkin's disease. So if you look at females versus males, uh, your relative risk is higher in males of developing uh, acute myocardial. It's 5.3 times compared to the general population though. 
and uh, with radiation alone, uh, they have five-fold high risk, and if you receive radiation with chemotherapy, you're at ten-fold higher risk. So it's it's a cumulative effect, dose and uh, combination therapy. Now. Uh, uh, type of cardiomyopathy that you'll see with radiation therapy, it's, uh, it causes myocardial fibrosis, so you're more likely to develop restrictive heart disease that puts you at a diastolic heart failure risk. With anthracyclines, you're actually more risk of developing systolic heart failure. Again, uh, the clinical heart failure is rare, but uh, it's a progressive effect. Later in life, you can go on to have uh, clinical heart failure. Now, this study, they looked at uh, echocardiographic parameters of uh, diastolic heart failure. And so they say the end diastolic mass and end diastolic dimension, these were the risk factors uh, that put you at risk of developing uh, diastolic heart failure. And these were significantly increased in uh, survivors of uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma that received high dose radiation to the chest and mediastinum. Now, pericardium is uh, the most affected uh, part of the heart after uh, you have received radiation. About 20 to 40 percent of these patients can go on to develop pericarditis. And uh, diagnosis is same as in general population. You get an EKG, you, you'll see your diffuse ST and T wave changes, uh, you'll see uh, your electrical alternance. You have decreased voltages, and on uh, an echocardiogram, you can see uh, pericardial thickening or pericardial effusion. It's a dose-dependent response. If the higher the dose, and uh, the numbers in parentheses are the percent of patients that develop pericarditis. So if you receive the highest dose, there's a 50 percent of these patients will develop pericarditis. And again, uh, you're, uh, it can happen almost instantly, or it can happen several years after you received your radiation therapy. Now, how do you monitor for these uh, cardiovascular effects? Um, you know, the f and you need to monitor because uh, of the frequency. A lot of patients are going to get it and the severity of the disease. Uh, this is one of the most uh, serious problems that these kids can develop. Now, but it's, the guidelines are difficult to establish because the number of survivors that go on to develop these effects is not, and there have, uh, is not very many, and there have not been uh, a lot of studies that have, that have been done to evaluate the impact of these uh, screening guidelines. But uh, once you finish your therapy, uh, yearly visits should be set up with PCP, and during these yearly uh, visits, PCP should focus on these questions. Ask about dyspnea ask if you have palpitations, chest pain, or you get short of breath with the activity. If any of these is a yes, an immediate uh, EKG and echocardiogram is warranted. Now, uh, for kids that were exposed to cardiotoxic agents, finish your therapy, you should always get a baseline uh, cardiac evaluation. Uh, EKG for all the patients or uh, patients who received anthracyclines, they can get either an echocardiogram or a radionucleotide uh, or a nuclear scan. Patients who received uh, radiotherapy, they need an echocardiogram and an um, e uh, EKG and echocardiogram. Don't get a radio nuclear study for, because radio nuclear study uh, does not, it, it cannot uh, find the structural defects. And if you see prolonged QTC, send them to a cardiologist. Uh, tell them not to take any of these agents, uh, your tricyclic antidepressants and microlides. Frequency, uh, there are no clear-cut guidelines. Uh, yearly visits, uh, full physical and history, and again, if you're at risk, uh, further evaluation. Now, uh, also, uh, so once these kids graduate from uh, the oncology clinics, they're given a treatment summary that summarizes how much dose of radiation or therapy you received. And a PCP should go by that dosing. If your dose was less than uh, 250, uh, and if you're less than five years of age, you need an echocardiogram every 10 years for anthracycline therapy. For kids who received uh, less than 30 gray radiation, these kids need an echocardiogram every five years. But for higher dosages, it's one to two year uh, follow-up uh, checks. 
it's the same uh, summary basically uh, outlines the risks you have with these agents and the uh, uh, follow up guidelines that I just talked about. For conclusions, uh, you should always assess the individualized risk for cardiovascular diseases uh, in these patients. Assess for uh, the risk factors. Uh, if you have pre-existing uh, risk factors, you're at high risk. Obtain a detailed review of symptoms uh, every year. Focus on your uh, cardiac review of systems and uh, monitor the cardiac function periodically or you can go back to your uh, COG guidelines and uh, check how often do these kids need a follow-up. Always counsel about your healthy heart habits. Pulmonary effects in these uh, kids. Uh, several studies have been done that have established uh, kids who receive uh, certain chemotherapy agents or radiation are at a risk for developing pulmonary dysfunction later in their life. Uh, Incidence rate varies from 20 to 100 percent. There's a wide discrepancy, but that's because the sample size was small or each of these studies, they used a different definition of defining pulmonary dysfunction. Now, it can be due to radiation, can be due to chemotherapy, or can be due to uh, stem cell transplant. This is a, a newer study that came out that looked at uh, the incidence of uh, pulmonary dysfunction versus uh, compared to the healthy controls. So not so much obstructive lung disease, but these kids are at a high risk of developing uh, restrictive lung disease, primarily due to radiation causing pulmonary fibrosis in these patients. Also, uh, about one third of these patients had abnormal uh, uh, diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. Now this is a, a table that summarizes the effects. You can see with different agents, radiation puts you at risk of pulmonary fibrosis, uh, interstitial pneumonitis, uh, restrictive and obstructive lung disease. And uh, again, the radiation doses. If your total dose is more than 15, you're at a high risk. Uh, your combination chemotherapy, uh, you're at high risk. Also, if you have a history of atopic disease or if you're a smoker. Uh, your chemotherapeutic agents, your uh, risulfan can cause pulmonary fibrosis, uh, again, the cumulative dose and uh, your combination therapy with radiation puts you at a high risk. Uh, same for bleomycin. Now stem cell transplant, it puts you at risk for developing bronchiolitis obliterans, bronchiectic bronchiectasis and chronic bron bronchitis later in life. And they say the risk is related to the prolonged immunosuppression these kids receive. So this is not a direct effect of the stem cell transplant, but due to uh, the secondary effect. And again, if you have a part of your lung taken out, uh, you're at risk of developing pulmonary complications. Uh, this is a study that was published in uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, Journal of Medicine, uh, basically showing the patients who received stem cell, or this is just one patient that received stem cell transplant, developed pulmonary fibrosis, and nine months later, uh, he developed a spontaneous pneumothorax. So your elastic recoil changes. So even smaller diseases, can, you, you're at risk of just rupturing your uh, pleura. Well, first step is you go over the treatment summary that uh, you received from the oncologist and uh, look at what specific therapy was done, uh, uh, was surgery, chemotherapy or radiation, and uh, what was uh, the time of diagnosis and what were the sites uh, involved. Um, so as for cardiac uh, toxicities, every yearly visit you should focus on chronic cough, if you have a fever, if you have shortness of breath. Uh, Baseline pulmonary function testing should be done, and this should not be done almost immediately once you finish. This should be done two years after you finish your therapy because a lot of these effects uh, won't be apparent uh, right after the completion of therapy. Now, uh, any time you are going for general anesthesia, you should have a reevaluation done. Uh, get a repeat pulmonary function testing. Now, scuba diving. Uh, it's kind of interesting they had a uh, section on scuba diving, uh, but apparently there are a lot of people who want to scuba dive that are cancer survivors. They have to be cleared by a pulmonologist. Uh, a PCP should not just go ahead and tell them you're cleared by it. Just go and do whatever you feel like. Go to a pulmonologist, get a clearance, and uh, go from there. Tell them not to smoke. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to 
cognitive effects. Uh, now, this is not well recognized, but this is one of the most debilitating uh, effects that can happen. Just because we don't realize these kids are having low grades in school, having a lot of issues, they have a lot of anxiety and stress. Now, uh, I found this article that uh, highlighted five primary groups that are at risk for developing uh, these effects. Any kid that has a tumor of CNS. All kids uh, with leukemia and non-Hodgkin's that received radiation or intrathecal therapy. All tumors of the face had uh, uh, face, eye, and skull that received uh, external beam radiation. Children who had total body radiation or uh, myeloablative chemotherapy in preparation for a stem cell transplant. And kids who were diagnosed <coughs> early and they spent a lot of time in the hospital for their therapy, they missed a lot of school, uh, so they're also at risk for developing uh, neurocognitive effects. Your contributing factors, how big is a tumor, what part of the brain it's involving, uh, what kind of surgery you had, how big of the part was resected, if you had a bleeding or infection following the surgery, uh, intrathecal therapy, or ra your radiation uh, dosing and amount. Okay, not all survivors will experience these effects. There is no way you can predict which one of these will go on to have these. So, uh, and they might not be uh, apparent for years and years after you finish your therapy. Risk factors, higher the dose of radiation, uh, okay, 24 gray or more, which is typically used for your brain tumors. That puts you at high risk. And they say it can cause a 20 to 50 point drop in your IQ points. That, that's a big drop. So if you have an IQ of 100, you can end up with the IQ of 50. Now, lower doses of radiation, which uh, we use for stem cell transplant preparation or for leukemia, uh, they can have, but it's much less severe. Also, your intrathecal therapy is a, a risk factor, females. So, um, and there are studies that showed Dexamethasone, when used for ALL, uh, these kids are uh, at a high risk compared to when we were using prednisone for ALL therapy. Now, they can have lower school grades. There's a higher risk of these kids being enrolled in uh, special education programs. And when they're enrolled in special education programs, they will spend a longer time in these education programs. They'll be missing a lot of school, and uh, they will. these are the kids that's a, that are at risk of uh, repeating a school year. So if we pay attention to special education and learning disability, uh, it's uh, the younger age, you're at a higher risk. And uh, the higher the dose of radiation, you're at a higher risk of being enrolled in a special education program. Same for the learning disability. Uh, younger age at diagnosis or the higher dose puts you at higher risk. OK, what are the recommendations for uh, these? Uh, kids from PCP, any survivor uh, uh, who's at risk of developing these long-term effects should be evaluated by a child psychologist upon entry into a long-term follow-up. Kids who are not going to a long-term follow-up, their PCP should refer them to a child psychologist. Now, uh, these kids should undergo uh, testing for their IQ measurement, uh, their school-based skills, and their information processing skills. Even if these tests are normal, these parents and teachers should be vigilant uh, because these, these are the common problems that these kids can have, uh, can develop. They can have spelling, math problem, ADHD is common in these uh, kids, and basically anything and everything <laughs> in school. Okay, uh, so PCP should request, if these effects are recognized, PCP should write to the school uh, for special accommodations. Uh, they should, kids should be seated. In the front of the class, uh, the teacher, teacher should try to minimize the amount of written work because of the handwriting problems. Math problems, uh, they should be uh, allowed to use a calculator. Uh, test modifications, uh, assignment of a classroom aid. And uh, just because there's a problem with concentration, uh, these uh, kids should uh, be allowed tape recorded lectures or uh, textbooks. Now, uh, second malignant neoplasms, again, this uh, is second or third most common cause of death in the survivors. And uh, factors that contribute to your second mal malignant uh, uh, neoplasm, they include uh, your, what was your primary diagnosis. 
what kind of therapy you received, uh, what was the time from the initial diagnosis and your uh, genetic predisposition to go on to have second cancers in life. The cumulative risk of developing a second cancer, it's uh, about 3 to 10% uh, within 20 years from completion of therapy. It's 5 to 20 times higher than what you would expect in uh, general population. Now, radiation uh, is associated with uh, development of thyroid cancer, breast cancer, and skin cancers, uh, and uh, solid neoplasms. And your alkylate, alkylating agents, they put you at risk for developing uh, leukemias later in life, primarily AMLs. Now, uh, children that are treated uh, for ALL, about 10% of those have this enzyme deficiency. Uh, and that places them at risk for uh, developing a second uh, leukemia or second cancer. And uh, the survivors of inherited form of retinal blastoma, uh, one out of two survivors will go on to develop a second cancer. And mostly they're at risk for developing bone cancers. Again, if you have one of these genetic conditions, there's a high chance that you'll develop a second, second cancer in life. This is, uh, this is a slide that just shows uh, any secondary neoplasm and uh, malignant neoplasm. So if you look, just look at Hodgkin's lymphoma, 40% of these kids will go on to uh, develop a second cancer late in life after they finish their therapy. In general, risk is somewhere between 5 to 10% for the rest of the malignancies, and it usually happens within the first 20 years. The same thing, usually uh, median time is between 5 to 20 years, and the number observed are uh, always higher than the number expected. So just be vigilant if these kids come in with weird symptoms. Now, uh, Children's Oncology Group, they have specific guidelines for some of these cancers. Uh, uh, for breast cancer, if you received, uh, you're at risk if you received uh, a radiation dose of 20 or more. And uh, these survivors should perform monthly uh, self breast exams and any lumps should be reported right away. Until the age of 25, they need to go see a physician yearly to get a clinical breast exam done, and after 25, uh, every six months. And uh, so this is a guideline different from the general population. Uh, These uh, survivors should get uh, mammograms and breast MRIs starting at 25 years of age or eight years after, the, after receiving radiation, whichever comes last. And then there are some other recommendations, uh, healthy eating habits, exercise, uh, try to breastfeed for at least four months. Don't smoke. Uh, for colon cancer, uh, anybody who received radiation to abdomen pelvis uh, at a dose of 30 or more should go a, diagnost uh, a screening colonoscopy every five years, starting at 35 or 10 years after, fin uh, after receiving radiation. And, uh, Avoid red meats, uh, eat more fruit and fruits and veggies, uh, stop smoking, and uh, whole grains. For skin conditions, uh, wear protective clothing, avoid activity, uh, use a sunscreen, avoid tanning boots, do not go out between 10 and 2 in the morning, and uh, when it's daylight saving, it's between 11 and 3. Uh, to summarize, uh, the number of long-term uh, adult survivors is increasing, uh, and with that comes a lot of problems that were not earlier recognized. And more than two-thirds of these patients will go on to have a chronic health problem uh, resulting uh, from the cancer therapy. Most of these conditions will be mild, but a, a significant fraction will have a severe disabling, life-threatening condition uh, related to their cancer therapy. Ideally, all survivors should go to a specialized uh, late effects clinic and be uh, evaluated by an oncology uh, team with a psychologist, but that's not always possible. So for PCPs, uh, they should always remain vigilant about the potential long-term effects and uh, seek additional help when needed. That's all I have. Thank you. That was a really uh, very nice uh, review and summary and gives us a lot of information about what we need to be looking forward to for, for, for treatment. Any quick questions? Dr. Koo?
that was a very nice comprehensive presentation. With so many physical, intellectual, potential problems, uh, can you elaborate uh, some aspects of psychosocial behavior issues well, in the long term survival? So, so I just talked about the neurocognitive effects. Uh, I really didn't get a lot into the psychosocial effects, but uh, these kids, uh, I think as I mentioned earlier just briefly, higher risk of developing anxiety problems, ADHDs, higher risk of developing post-traumatic stress disorder. These kids are, uh, or these kids that when once they go to adulthood, they're always worried about a recurrence. Uh, financial issues, uh, these patients cannot find uh, insurance easily. So there's, there's a whole plethora of uh, problems that, uh, especially the psychosocials, mm -hmm. that we actually frequently miss, but uh, I don't think there's an easy fix to it. Um, they, these kids are gonna have long-term uh, psychological issues, difficult to integrate into society for these patients. No. For the, the PCP following these kids, mm -hmm. Depends uh, where these kids are being followed up. So if they're in a bigger center that has a long term, so a lot of these bigger programs have survivorship programs, like teams and teams dedicated to, for these issues. But if you're in a remote area in a smaller clinic and you don't have red, red, ready access to an oncologist, PCP should get started and then send them over. Like EKGs, yearly EKGs, PCPs can do it. If you're screening for precocious puberty, that workup can be done outpatient and then send them to an endocrinologist. So for me, one, one thing which Garo focused on was history and physical. I'm trying to tell the students about a good history, a good physical will diagnose 70, 80% of problems. So yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I remember a case when I was a resident, one says, well, my kid now can't climb up one flight of stairs when he used to be able, and he was in full heart failure. So, just as simple as uh, listening to mom, taking the history, and then, you know, either finding a center or you'll do the initial workup and then refer them. 